moments once again that we come before you this morning with grateful hearts, Lord, thanking you for all that you've done for us. Lord, as we come before you, we come repenting of all sins that we have committed by thought, by word, and by deed. Heavenly Father, forgive us any of sins of omission, Lord, that we failed to offer to you to ask for forgiveness. We thank you for another beautiful Sunday. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that with all that's going on in the world, we are still able to come together, Heavenly Father, and to meet one another over these airways. Heavenly Father, we just say thank you. We thank you, Lord, for sparing our lives, for you call many home, Heavenly Father, and you left us here, Heavenly Father, to be a witness and to keep on praying to an unseen God and trusting in you to hear and answer our prayers. Lord, we're not so much worthy as to bow before you, but you made it worthy through your son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for salvation. Heavenly Father, be in this service this morning. Lord, touch every soul that has come on the line. Heavenly Father, bless every household, every man, woman, and child today, Lord. Fill us with what we need, Heavenly Father. But you have called the servant, Dr. Curry, to preach to us the word. Heavenly Father, we pray that the spirit of your spirit will lead God and teach him what to teach us. But make us willing, Lord. Touch our minds and hearts and have mercy upon us that we will yield to the word that we hear and we will study to show ourselves approved. Lord, we thank you for bringing us down through all of these months, weeks, and days. Heavenly Father, in being closed in, yet, Lord, you provided all of our needs and, and some of our wants. Heavenly Father, you've taught some of us many lessons and some have yet not learned, Lord. So we have to keep on praying, Heavenly Father, and keep passing your word on that men and women and children might become to be saved. Lord, if there's anything in our lives that not right as a member as a membership we ask that you would go through the entire membership lord cleanse and convict us of our sins and help us to pray for forgiveness to move forward to be a church that you're calling for in these treacherous days oh lord heavenly father watch over the young children heavenly father as they prepare to go back to school heavenly father we just ask that you be with them lord Lord, we just ask that you would teach them and take care of them. Heavenly Father, the world is offering so much to them. Lord, help us to be good parents, grandparents, and guardians. Heavenly Father, walking upright and living right, not just talking and talk, but walking it, Lord. Heavenly Father, in our homes, over our telephone, and wherever we go, if we're believers, let the world see it within us. Not for show, Lord. But if we've truly been converted, we should be proud to know that you can lead us down the right road. And I just say thank you, Jesus. I pray, Lord, for the message this morning. I pray for every member of the church. I pray for every organization of the church. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that you've taken us through another conference year in this denomination. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you would make all the decisions, not man, but you, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. We pray, Heavenly Father, now we pray for our sick. There's so many, so many confined to their homes and so many, Lord, that needed to be lifted up. Heavenly Father, and then we have so many bereaved families today. Our church has been hit very hard with distant relatives and Heavenly Father and all types of stuff. We just say that you, we just thank you for keeping us and keeping our minds to reach out to those families as best we could. Heavenly Father, we just pray that you would continue to bless all the bereaved families, especially those that have just buried their loved ones, Heavenly Father, and those that are still into deep grief. Grief can go on for a long time, Lord. It depends on us. We have to remember that you brought us here and you didn't promise no length of time. But Heavenly Father, those of us who have con been converted and turn our wheels of life over to you, we know that this is just another step to reach heaven. Heavenly Father, we pray blessings upon this church. Heavenly Father, we're a small church compared to others. 
but we do mighty works, O oh Lord. I'm so proud to be a member here. Heavenly Father, teach us right from wrong. Help us to get along. I pray for the pastor as he tries to cover this flock, O oh Lord. Give him wisdom and knowledge and then touch our minds and hearts and be willing to follow Heavenly Father. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just be in everything that we do. We thank you for all the food drives that we've had this year. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for those who came out and helped and still coming out. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the food that reached all the various homes. So many people ask, what are we really doing? I guess it's what are you really doing? Lord, I thank you that even up, me, myself up in age, I've been able to hustle around and try to help as best I could. Heavenly Father, and I just thank you for the first responders. I'm so grateful that you brought us through, but Lord, we're gearing up for another variance now, Lord, and teach us what to do and to listen to science, Heavenly Father. But most of all, to pray to you every day, every hour and turn our lives and our wills over to you. Now, Lord, keep us safe. Heavenly Father, from all hurt, harm, and danger, we pray, Heavenly Father, where is a need in this membership or any friend that have joined in on the line. Lord, we just ask that you would hear our prayer, Lord. Lead God and direct us, we pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. Heavenly Father, I just pray that we one day we won't have to wear masks and one day we won't have to be exiled off from each other. Lord, I just say thank you, but help us, Heavenly Father, keep our minds sharp and open to all the dangers that are around us. People have gone crazy in this world, but Heavenly Father, we don't have to go with them because your spirit can keep, keep us in perfect peace. Lord, I just say thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. If there's anything that I failed to pray for today, I ask that you would forgive me, Heavenly Father, for I'm weak, but you are strong. And Lord, I just thank you to be able to come into the house of worship this morning. Oh, Lord, I just say thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
to his house of worship saying, I will bless the Lord for he's worthy to be praised. Come on and give God the praise this morning. Oh, and bless the Lord. Oh, he's worthy. God bless you. It's good to be with you uh, this morning. I'm glad to see you all online and watching the videos. I pray that you have a prosperous week and I pray that you will continue to pray for us as we go through the transition to begin to start opening uh, the church. So we are not quite there yet, but we're almost there and we're thankful to God uh, for his provision. So keep us in your prayers and pray for the, our general conference, which is this week coming up and we are thankful uh, to God for all of you and all your prayers. I want to turn your attention to Matthew chapter 18, verses 1 through 5. And uh, I want to just deal with that, and then I'm going to get out your way uh, so you can enjoy your Sabbath. It says here, at the time the disciples, at that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a child whom he put among them and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. So the disciples came to Jesus and says, who is the greatest? talk to you this morning from the subject so you want to be great so you want to be great let's pray Lord we thank you for this opportunity to come before you and to hear your preached word God we ask that you would come and bless and God you would hear our cry God open up our eyes that we may see our ears that we may hear and our hearts that we may receive In Jim Collins' most famous and best-selling book, he says, good is the enemy of great. He further explains how the limitation we place upon ourselves to only be good prevents us from achieving greatness. We have a good life. We attend a good church. We live in a good neighborhood, went to a good school, have a good job. Life is good, but life can be great. <laughs> yes, uh, the motto at Solid Rock is to be the best on the block and the nicest in the neighborhood. And if you've been here, you will hear, hear me say that every Sunday. Uh, and the reason for that is because I want everyone to hear and I wanted everyone to hear, for even from the first day I came, is that it's just not enough to be good. It's better to be the best. <laughs> uh, and, and being the best doesn't mean you get the most likes, doesn't mean you get the most views, doesn't mean you have the most followers, you're on TV and social stuff. Being the best means the best at where you are. Being the best is your responsibility and it's your birthright. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. And if you're going to represent heir to the kingdom, you need to do everything you do the best way you can. Now for some of you, not all, as soon as I push you to be the best, even hearing the words, to be the best makes self-doubt arise. Now I'm talking to somebody right now. For those who don't know, self-doubt sounds like this. Because some of you say, well, I'm not talking. Let me tell you what it sounds like. I'm not that talented, so I can't be the best. There's nothing I can do to change my situation. Well, you just don't know my story. And I tell you what, I don't know your story, but I'm here 
today to declare to you that in 2021, it's time to start a new story. We're in the summer right now, and after we've gone through a rough 2020 and a rough 2021, it's time for a restart. And some of us are really anxiously wanting just hearing somebody just say, let's just do it over. And we have adopted unconsciously uh, living out the story of somebody else. Uh, we, we have played somebody else's story. As a result, our stories that we have adopted are now in syndication in our own lives. So we play the same story over and over. Well, Pastor, it's just the way it is. Is it? I want to ask you the question, or have we accepted a mediocrity in our life? Let me announce to you, that old book is closed. <laughs> no more chapters in the book of 2020 and early 2021. It's time to write a new story. You are the author of your own story. And you, you know, when we think about how God has placed us and where we are today, and we're fortunate to even just be in the land of the living, the land of the free, and home of the brave, God has placed us here to be a blessing to others. So it's time for us to rewrite this book. I know what happened in the past. I know how you grew up in your childhood. I understand that you had a struggle to get through stuff. You had a lot of obstacles. But it's time to write the new book. Those chapters are closed. That book is over. Let's start with the new story. What are you talking about, Pastor? Well, okay, let me help you out here. You got into debt early, and you can't see your way out. The new story says you got out. I want you to rewrite that story. Uh, you have a sickness, and you've never been healed of it. Your new story says you prayed again, and you were healed by his grace. <laughs> you got all that, you got feel me. Okay, you feel guilty of your past sins and your past deeds and your family and your friends, your co-workers, they like to hold it over your head. Your new story says you've been, you've been forgiven. You, you have moved on to a new book, not a new chapter. You got a whole new book now because now God is saying that, look, your old story was good. It was all right. It had some flaws. We had some hiccups. But your new story is going to be great. Ooh. Uh, so do you want to be great? Do you want to be great? So I ask you the question. Uh, and I hope you say, yes, I do. I, I want to be great. I want to be everything that God has placed and designed for me. I want to be who God wants me to be. You should want to be great because God made you great. Uh, you were born great. No matter what people may tell you, no matter how bad your beginning was, you can write the end of your story. You are the first and not the last. You are the head and not the tail. And I want you to rise above the fear that you're experiencing because the story of the good goes like this. I've seen great people, but they have become something that is not really great in my eyes. Mm. They, they are the best at what they do, but they just... Um, from what I can see, they just act like a jerk. I understand you have seen examples of people who have achieved certain greatness and you have taken on their story and incorporated it into your life and now you don't want to be great because you think you're going to end up like them. Mm. Ooh, but your story does not have to look like their story. Mm, God help me here. See, being great could be being the greatest supporter, being the greatest encourager, being the greatest friend, being the greatest listener, being the greatest husband, being the greatest wife, being the greatest mother, being the greatest father. What does it take to be great? Well, the disciples asked this question to Jesus, and it led to this question. Actually, they said to Jesus, who is the greatest? In heaven. Uh, <laughs> but what led to this question is really what I want to explore. It, it started in chapter 17. Jesus handpicks a few disciples to head up the mountain with him. And in this special moment, they got a glimpse.
lips of some of the prophets uh, now residing in heaven. And as they are being overwhelmed with seeing this great vision from God, uh, they begin to set up temples and idol worship for the other prophets. And God the Father speaks through glory and says, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. And after they have just gotten that experience, right after the mountaintop, the fa the, uh, a father approaches the disciples for mercy on his son who had a rare disease. Now, watch this. Now, what we're building up to is now we have a select group that's been isolated, taken with Jesus, and they experience something that's greater than anything else they've ever seen. They come down from the mountain, and as soon as they come down from the mountain, we, the, the, they're filled with glory, filled with power. They, they've seen this stuff. They, they feel empowered. And the father has a son who has epilepsy. They approach the disciples. The disciples look full with power, full with authority, full with God's grace and anointing. And the disciples could not heal the son. So, and so in embarrassment, they go to Jesus and Jesus, can you just, can you do this for us? We couldn't do it. And Jesus heals the young lad and strongly rebukes the disciples in private, saying, if you had the faith as small as a mustard seed, you could have done this yourself. Now watch this. They just got finished seeing something, right? They saw something, but now they can't see themselves doing something. Uh, see, a lot of us, we have, we, we have to see something in order to believe it, right? So they, they did not believe that they could heal. Mm, all right, watch this. So he said, if you had the faith of a mustard seed, you could have done this yourself. So we have an experience where God the Father is talking to the disciples, and he says, this is my son. Then we have an experience where a father brings a son. Mm. Then the next story in chapter 17 is the temple tax collectors come and they inquire about Jesus paying the temple tax. Jesus turns and asks, oh, he says, who do you think should pay this temple ta tax, Simon? And, Jesus, uh, and Simon said, well, um, you know, everybody gets taxed. And he says, well, Jesus says, all right, let me ask you this. From whom do kings on the earth take their toll or tribute? From their children? Or from others. And Simon said, of course, from others. You know, children can't pay them. They can't pay the tax. And Jesus said, the children are free from the tax. Isn't that right? Yes, that's right. And he says, look, he says, I just want you to understand that me being a king of the king of glory, me being the king of heaven, I don't have to pay this tax, but I'm going to do it for your sake. Watch that. All right. So with the children are free from the tax huh, placed upon uh, the earthly kings. All right, watch that. Uh, so chapter, <laughs> so watch that. So we got a son uh, that the father says, this is my son. Then we have Jesus healing the son. And then we have Jesus talking about the son or the children, talking about some children are free from tax from the kings of the earth. All right, we're going to work this out. So in chapter 17 is dealing with sons or dealing with children. We, we see a pattern of God talking about, this is my child. And if someone brings him a child, and then they talk about Jesus as saying, the children have to pay a tax. Now we get to verse 18, chapter 18. And, and after the disciples being handpicked, and um, we, we get this trying to heal, even fishing a coin out of the, the mouth of him, they ask Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? That's where we get to this point right now. And did they really think, uh, you know, I was wondering about this, that this was the kind of question that Jesus would appreciate trying to answer. You know, you know what they wanted to hear, of course, they, 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 they wanted to hear is that they were the greatest, that they were the most important people of the kingdom. After all, they were handpicked, they were selected. And maybe you've been like this. Maybe you've always been favored. Maybe you've always been selected. Maybe you've always had, because of your hard work, because of your anointing, because of your favor. And maybe you think that maybe that, you know, you might be the greatest. But this is what Jesus does. He pulls a fast one on them. He grabs a kid, a child, out of the crowd. And he says, you see this little child? He's important. 
In fact, he's so important that unless you become like this child, you're not even getting into the kingdom. Now, whoa, 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 whoa hold up now. Jesus is now saying that we got, in order to get into the kingdom, we got to become like this child. Now, that was not the answer they were looking for, and it caught them by surprise. He confused the disciples, and the disciples, uh, the disciples were, were wondering what is going on here. Now, I want to ask you the question. If we have to become like children to get into the kingdom, there's a lot of transformation that needs to happen. Oh, God. So you want to be great? Who is the greatest in the kingdom? Come here, bring me this child. It, it's like, I'm not looking at your merits. I'm not looking at what you did. I'm not looking at who you're standing next to. I'm not even looking at your relationship with me. Watch this. The disciples were with Jesus all in. Who is the greatest? He brings them a child. They're not even in the circle. Oh, God, help me. Holy Ghost. Uh, so you, right now, with all the gifts and all the talents and all that anointing and favor that you have upon you, that don't mean nothing. What means everything is if you are like a child. What does that mean? What does that mean? He pulls this child, and because, and I look at this because I said, what is it that's so special about this child? We don't know the child's name. We don't know the background of the child. We don't know if their parents put him in a good school. We don't know if he was, the child was raised right. But he pulls a child, and he points at a child because children have an innocence. They have humility and honesty as the mark of true greatness. <laughs> humility and honesty. Because children are weak in strength, power, because they are weak in status, small, voiceless spirits are likely to be overlooked. Are you one of those people? Well, maybe you're just a quiet storm. You're just a person. I just am quiet, I'm low key. I, you know, I don't like being people face. Uh, and sometimes you feel overlooked. You don't feel like you get the attention. Or this. I'm here to tell you, you are developing in the process of becoming great. God says he looks for those qualities. Not all the time. You got to know when to be a lion and when to be a lamb. Jesus didn't save us as a lion. Jesus saves us as the lamb. All right, I mean, I can't go there too much because I might preach on something else. But I want to ask the question, maybe we might be in a position of authority. Do we recognize the small voices around us? The soft, gentle answers. The touches of light that shine through the words of hope that come and penetrate our hearts. So, entry to the kingdom has a high bar. We must change to become like children. So what is it that I need to change the most about me? That, that's the question we need to ask ourselves. We don't need to point out to anybody else that, oh, they need to be like this. No, focus on you. What is it about children that makes them so great in God's eyes? makes them most likely to enter the kingdom. Is it their innocence? Anybody who knows kids knows that, you know, kids ain't always innocent. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Uh, is it their obedience? Kids ain't always obedient. The most compliant kids are always obedient. Is it their enthusiasm? It, it, no, I mean, kids are not always enthusiastic. Uh, is it they, um, it, Jesus tells us what it is. He, he says this is what it is about them. Whoever humbles themselves like this little child. All right, I like this. Uh, so, uh, watch this. Kids are dependent upon their guardians. They're smaller, they're younger than everyone else around them. They know they need help and they aren't afraid to ask. Grandma, can you help me make me some lunch? Uh, Daddy, can you go get me some food? Kids know their needs. They recognize their limitations. They're honest about their request for help. Maybe, maybe our limitations for being great here on earth may be blocked because we just don't ask for help. We don't ask for help. Watch this. I ain't saying ask for help for someone who already did it. Mm -mm. No, no, no. Watch this. I'm saying ask your 
guardian for help. <laughs> Ask your heavenly father for help. Oh my God. I just hope I have y'all right now. God said, I want you to talk to me. Mm. Uh, see, kids, that they recognize, they limitate, they are honest about what they, they can do and what they can't do. Because being great requires you to be fully dependent on God as your guardian. That's the key. You want to be great in the kingdom or here on earth? The secret to both is humility. God places us in, in spots where we have opportunities to, to be humble before him. Uh, God will never promote you unless you're ready to be promoted. Watch that. <laughs> See, God places earthly leaders in front of us to test our humility. And I'm, I'm afraid for some folks that, you know, it, you know, if we can't pass this earthly test, how can we pass the heavenly test? It is right there in the Word. The Bible says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. We face many problems every day. Some of the problems seem overwhelming. But no matter our situation, the Bible urges us to seek humility and reject pride. See, God knows how to lift you up. He, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. What is humble? Humble means I, I recognize I don't have a lot of strength. I recognize I can't do this without you. And, and see, God, he says, I will lift you up. See, God will lift you up when your humility makes people think they can disrespect you. God will lift you up when your humility makes people think they can walk over you. God will lift you up when your humility makes people think they can overlook you. Keep being humble. And the Bible says, those who humble themselves shall be exalted. You're on the path to being all the way up, all the way up. God wants to pull you up. Just continue being humble. Continue living in humility. Somebody say, my day is coming. I'm, I'm about to be lifted up. I don't know if you feel down right now, but God says, all right, I hear what you're saying. Just call my name. Just call my name, and I'm going to lift you up. You feeling bad? You got aches and pain? Call my name. I'm going to lift you up. You might not feel good all day long, but call my name every single moment. Keep my name on your breath, and I will continuously lift you up. And see, some people don't like Hearing this because they think humbling themselves leaves them open to ridicule because they're being weak. But maybe you said to yourself, well, I don't need this type of preaching. I, I, I have enough personality and talent and skill set to make it through my life on my own. I can look after myself. I can pay my own bills. I can wash my own self. I can achieve whatever I need to as long as I put my mind to it. I can make a difference in the world. I don't need this humility stuff, this soft stuff. Well, according to the word of God, you might not get into the kingdom. Plain and simple. I ain't going to sugarcoat it at all. It, it, Jesus was a real man who had plenty of fire and courage and he wasn't a soft, wussy kind of guy. He cleaned out the temple with the whip and told the religious leaders that they were a nest of snakes, told that man that he's a fox. His humility didn't mean he was passive and always softly spoken, but his humility meant that he always knew that his father was in control. So Jesus pulls this child among the disciples and he teaches them a lesson about himself. Ooh, this is gold right here. You ain't gonna find this in no commentary. You're not gonna find this online. Watch this. Jesus's submission to his father's will was an expression about his trust in his father. Oh my goodness. Jesus said, I seek not to please myself, but him who sent me. I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of whom sent me. My teaching is not my own. He, he took a lower place in order to give God the glory. 
Who am I talking to right now? Maybe you feel like you had a place that's beneath you. You should have been better off in this age of your life. You should have been in a different place, a different position where you are right now. But Jesus says this. He says, look, Jesus, I became a servant because the greatest among you shall be your servant. So God created us in his image. And we are to be his servants. And a servant is a humble person. Jesus came into our world to introduce humility. Now humility is powerful because it strips away uh, everything that props our ego up, our social status, our wealth, our pride, you know, who likes us. A, a, a servant, though, is not greater than his master. But watch what Jesus did. He made no reputation of his own. And he took the form of a servant and was made in likeness of men. And being found in the likeness of man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Even death unto a cross. Wherefore, God also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. Glory be to God the Father. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. And whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So you want to be great. I have three words for you. Humility, humility, humility. And if you don't know what that means, just be like Jesus. God bless you.